At this point, it's probably not a surprise that the Sony a7 IV is a genuinely great camera. In fact, as I've said before, the Sony is so neat. But from a video-centric perspective, let's compare it to the Sony a7S III and the FX3 to see who the a7 IV is even for. And as is the case with my other Sony reviews, this video is not sponsored. I purchased all of these cameras myself with my own money, and I've had the Sony a7 IV for about five months at the time I'm recording this video. To jump straight to the conclusion, the a7 IV is Sony's most accessible hybrid camera, and it is a super solid choice. You'll really like it if you want a full frame camera that can deliver great video and take incredible photos, especially if you want incredible low light performance and pretty much the best autofocus that you can get right now. And so basically, let's talk about more of the basics of the Sony a7 IV. It has a 33 megapixel sensor, which I'm using the FX3 and the a7S3 with an anamorphic lens for no reason to film this video. And both of these cameras have a 12 megapixel sensor. So this 33 megapixel sensor is way better for still photos. It's also a 7K sensor for video that is downsampled to 4K. So you're getting ultra sharp 4K video from what is really a 7K sensor. And the fact that Sony does position this as a hybrid photo and video camera is really important because that is the camera strength, but it is also the reason that there are some compromises. The form factor is extremely similar to the a7S III, although it's not identical, and the build quality of the a7S III is slightly better than the a7 IV. As is the case with pretty much all modern cameras, it has two card slots, but they are not matching card slots. One of them is a regular SD card slot, and the other is a CF Express Type A combo slot that can take Type A cards, believe it or not, or also just regular SD cards. With all my cameras, I've just been using regular V90 SD cards. The FX3 and the A7S3, both of the card slots are combo slots. So you can have Type A cards on both cameras. And with both those cameras, the Type A cards also give you access to higher frame rates, higher megabit recording, just the ultra high quality, the highest possible quality you could get out of those cameras. On the A7 IV, I don't really feel like I'm missing out by not using a Type A card. Maybe that's just my Type A personality. Battery life, like with most modern Sony cameras, has gotten really good on the A7 IV. It's so hard to give an actual like quantitative, this is what the battery life is. But what I can tell you is that it's great. I do think in my experience, I've gotten better battery life from the A7 IV just a little bit than I have from either of my other cameras. If you're shooting mainly video and you're constantly filming and it's constantly recording in 4K, I've been able to get at least a couple hours of constant, you know, use, recording, stop recording, go through the menus, record more, that kind of usage. If you're doing photos, I've been easily able to go, you know, past a whole day just doing photos. But like with pretty much any camera, if you're going somewhere with this, it's always a good idea to bring at least one extra battery just so that way you have nothing to worry about and you have plenty of power. You can though run it off of USB-C, which is great, so you can connect it to wall power through USB-C or even a battery bank through USB-C, so that does give you some more versatility. You can also charge it that way, so if you find yourself with one dead battery on any of these cameras, you still have some options to either power the camera or charge it without having the actual battery charger with you. Which, by the way, this does not come with a regular battery charger, it only comes with the USB-C charger. It's a $2,500 camera, doesn't come with a battery charger. That's stupid. But what's not stupid is the stupid amount of ports that this camera has, which is pretty much exactly the same as the higher end cameras. And that's sort of a running theme here is this camera retails for $2,500. The FX3 is $3,800. The a7S3 is $3,400, $3,500. And a lot of the features are exactly the same. So for less money, you're getting a lot of the same features. Right here, you have a 3.5 millimeter microphone input, which is its own little separate door. So that way you can fully open and articulate the screen while your microphone is connected to the camera. Below that, you've got a headphone output. Below that, you've got your USB-C and then your multi-function micro USB connector. And then you have, drum roll please, Canon take notes full-size HDMI because it doesn't make sense for a camera that has a lot of video features and is pretty expensive not to have full-size HDMI. And uh, those are all the ports. And they have the little doors instead of flaps, which I really like on all of these cameras. Now, of course, if you have everything connected, if you have microphone, headphone, USB, and HDMI, it will obstruct the view of the LCD display, but that's true for pretty much any camera that has a flip-out screen. 
As you might be aware, they did change the way that the mode switch works on the top of the a7 IV, so while it looks a lot like the a7S III, the mode switch has two layers, and right below it, there is this separate little switch that goes from photo to video to slow and quick mode, which is nice because it's kind of like the switch Canon used to have, and I guess is kind of bringing back on some of their cameras right here, where it used to be a thumb switch to go from photo to video mode, which I thought was the absolute best way to handle that. This is almost as good as that. It's pretty easy to use. And the cool part about it is on the mode dial, you have three custom function settings. And so every time you switch to a new mode, you now have three physical custom function settings. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, it does have a flip out screen, which fortunately seems to be pretty standard across Sony's lineup now. And that's awesome. It's incredibly helpful, not just for like vlogging stuff, but having an articulating screen, I mean, being able to monitor a camera that's not near you is great. Being able to just get other views and angles is awesome. Like the versatility of a fully articulating screen is hugely valuable for both photo and video. And I'm really happy to see that on all of Sony's cameras. Unfortunately, it's the same three inch, very average quality LCD that they've been putting on everything. And this has been my complaint with all my other Sony cameras. The LCD screen is just not that great. It isn't super color accurate. It isn't super high resolution. And it's also sort of a weird semi widescreen, semi four by three aspect. It's like a weird aspect ratio. Again, just to really drive this home, my Canon EOS R from 2018, which was also significantly less expensive than any of these cameras, has this beautiful, super high resolution, widescreen, color accurate, touch display. It really drives me crazy that the more expensive Sony cameras have these less than stellar quality screens. But fortunately, this camera does have a really nice electronic viewfinder that works great. If you're somebody who likes EVFs, it's awesome. I program this little button over here to switch between the display and the EVF. So that way, if you need to switch quickly, you can do that. And there is a sensor that will do it automatically, but I have found the sensor is a little too aggressive. <laughs> and if you just kind of get behind the camera, it suddenly switches. So I'd rather be in charge of pushing the button myself. And one of the differences between the a7 IV and the a7S III is actually where the little indent is to flip out the screen. On the a7S III, it's up at the top, and on the a7 IV, it's kind of down at the bottom, which is a little bit easier when you're holding the camera, but honestly, I found that it's a little more difficult if the camera's mounted on a tripod because you have to kind of like reach down here like while the camera is on something, and it's a little easier to just open it up from there. Now, as is the case with all of the modern Sony cameras, the autofocus on the a7 IV is absolutely amazing. It really locks onto your subject, especially the eye autofocus, and it just sticks there. And you have all kind of flexibility over the sensitivity. I think that it's the same autofocus system as the FX3 and the a7S III, but I think that the firmware running it is a little more refined and advanced, and it seems like the performance is slightly like ever so slightly better on the a7 IV than the other cameras. The a7 IV does feature the newer menu system that more of the newer Sony cameras have, but I have noticed that this is slightly more refined and even better than the menu system on the FX3 and the a7S III. And of course, not only are there just tons of buttons all over the camera, but you can customize pretty much everything, including one of my biggest gripes with the a7S III, this exposure compensation dial. On the a7IV, they've taken the markings off of this dial because on the a7S III, if you use the camera in any kind of manual mode, this dial becomes useless. It doesn't work for exposure compensation, but right now you can't assign it to anything else. On the a7 IV, you can assign it to whatever you want. So I have mine set to adjust my audio level, which means I can just turn this and it's gonna bring the audio level up or down. And then if I have it where I want it, I can push in the little button to lock it and it's awesome. Normally I set the joystick on the back to adjust the audio, but since I don't have to do that, I do owe a shout out to Patrick Tommaso, who recommended setting this to be the Super 35 crop in mode. So if I push this button, the camera will then punch into the Super 35 crop mode, which the other cameras don't have, this camera can have a Super 35 crop because it has that 33 megapixel sensor. And then also with Sony's clear image zoom that works with some lenses, you can then zoom in even further a little bit, like 1.5 times without losing resolution. So that means even when you're using a prime lens, which is a fixed focal length, you have a whole lot of options between full frame, Super 35, and sometimes, depending on the lens, clear image zoom as well, which is really, really cool. When these cameras are turned off, I don't know if this is 
good or I should be doing this, but you can kind of hear something knocking around in there, and that is the built-in in-body image stabilization, the IBIS, which is, I think, truly fantastic. I know a lot of people who've been using Panasonic IBIS for a long time kind of hold that up as the holy grail. I haven't used it myself, so I can't say for sure, but the IBIS on all of these cameras is really, really great. Here's a couple of very quick, super scientific tests. This is walking with no stabilization on. I'm just holding it and walking, walking with no stabilization and running with no stabilization on. This is walking with standard stabilization, standard stabilization walking. I'm just holding it and running with standard stabilization running whoa and this is walking with active stabilization it did crop in just a little bit but this is walking with active stabilization and running with active stabilization and the last basic feature to talk about is how easy is it to work with the files from this camera that has been an issue with a lot of the more current camera releases from all kinds of brands 4k 8k high resolution all these different codecs and it's great to film in that, but then you try to put the files into your computer and your computer just wants to explode because it's really hard to work with those things. Fortunately, most of the time I film in the XAVC S mode, which is like the second highest quality. The XAVC SI mode would be the higher quality one. And it works great. I have no problem editing those files. They just get a little bit bigger. And for the most part, unless you're shooting something that has a whole bunch of stuff happening on screen, like a crowd of people, or you're in a forest where there's all kinds of trees and branches and all these little details that are moving all over the place, you probably don't need the SI mode. The regular XAVC S mode will be just fine. But I've had really no issues editing any of the files from any of these cameras on any of my M1 Mac computers. So I have the base model Mac mini, which is the cheapest Apple computer you can buy. It's like under $700. And then I have the M1 Max MacBook Pro. This one obviously does work a little bit better, especially if I have layers of footage. But the files work great on both of these computers. Something I definitely recommend if you're thinking of making a big camera purchase is to rent the camera first. Not sponsored, but I've used LensRentals.com many times just to test things out and they're pretty affordable. You can rent a camera like this for a week for not very much money at all. And then you can use it in your actual workflow. You can take the files, put them on your computer, run them through your editing application and see how everything works before you actually purchase the camera. But now let's talk about what is arguably the most important part of any camera, and that is the image quality. And I say arguably because this is a Red One from 2007, which is like a professional movie making camera. It's a 4.6K camera. And even though it's older, the image quality from this is absolutely beautiful. But setting the camera up and using it and getting to a point where you can get that image quality is a really tiring, involved, process. So while the image quality is great, it's hard to recommend something like that because it's not very practical to use most of the time. So not only do all of these cameras have great image quality, but they're also very easy to use, which means it's very easy to get that great image quality. And on top of the great video, which is what I mainly use the camera for, the photos are amazing. They are super crisp, super sharp. And because they're 33 megapixels, you have plenty of opportunity to enlarge prints if you want to, or to crop in and do a lot of different like compositing and adjusting and Photoshopping or whatever you might need to do. Now, as I mentioned earlier, part of the reason that the video image quality is so great is because you have a 7K sensor that's being downscaled to 4K. But if you watch my other reviews on the FX3 and the A. 7s3 you might remember that i said the 12 megapixel sensor was kind of the super wow power so why is it great now to have a higher resolution sensor when i said it was great to have a lower resolution sensor earlier the 7k sensor does give you a really sharp really clear image some people have said that it's too sharp and i think that's just a matter of personal preference I don't think so, but I also grew up using camcorders and eight millimeter VHS cameras that always look like a mushy mess. And so when you have a nice full frame camera like this, you'll pretty much never hear me complain about the image being too sharp. And I'll also not ever be somebody who puts like a mist filter or a haze filter on my camera to make it look less sharp because 
I spent my whole childhood shooting in mush, and now I like super sharp cameras. My usual workflow is just to use the default picture profile, and I think that it actually looks really good. I played around with s Cinetone, I played around with S-Log, and those are also great, but just sort of the default picture profile, which actually is just on screen, it just says PP off, which sounds like something you should see the doctor about. That gives me the image that I like, and I put it in Final Cut, and I kind of just adjust it a little bit. Filming in 10-bit, you have lots of color information that you can push and adjust and make things look just how you want them. If you do want to film in S-Log, then you have even more flexibility with your exposure and your color. But in my experience, whether you're using a picture style or you're using a log profile, it's very easy to mix this footage with the other Sony cameras that I have, which is awesome. And speaking of those other Sony cameras, let's talk about how the a7 IV stacks up against them when it comes to low light performance. You will be delighted to know that this is an awesome low light camera. That's kind of something Sony has been known for. I think on paper and technically, this is not quite as strong of a performer in low light as the FX3 and the a7S III because of the sensor, but I still think that this is really, really impressive and you can judge for yourself. So here is a quick comparison between the a7 IV and the a7S III in pretty much pitch black darkness. This is the a7 IV. We are at f1.4 with ISO 100 and a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second. It's dark outside except for these market lights that you can see. So this is ISO 100, ISO 320, ISO 400, ISO 640, 800, 1000, 1250, 1600, 2000, 2500, 3200, 4000, 5000, 6400, 8000, 12800, ISO 16000, 20,000, 32,000, 40,000, 64,000, 80,000, and 1,000, no, 102,400. Hey, look, there's our dog, Ben. If I stop down the aperture to f3.5, this looks pretty well exposed, and you can judge for yourself how clear or unclear it is. Now we're going to do basically the exact same thing with the Sony a7S III. This is ISO 100 and aperture is at f1.4. ISO 320, ISO 640, 1600, 2500, 3200, 4000, 5000, 6400, 8000, 10,000, 12,800, 16,000, 20,000, 32,000, 40,000, 64,000, 80,000. And we are at the max of the A7 IV, which is 102,400. And in fact, I'll pop the A7 IV up side by side so you can see the A7IV's quality at 102,400. Now, the A7S III does continue to go up to 128,000, 160,000, 204,800. 256,000, 32, no, 320,000, 409,600. ISO is higher than the number of subscribers my channel will ever have. And I can stop this down to F5.0 so you can see how noisy the highest ISO of 409,000 is on the A7S III. Let's check out ISO 32,000 on both cameras, Whoa. ISO 16,000 on both cameras, 6,400 on both cameras, 3,200 on both cameras. <laughs> Now, while there are a lot of great things about this camera, unlike me, the a7 IV just isn't perfect. There are definitely a few potentially major issues that you should be aware of, but how major those issues are totally depends on your preferences and your specific workflow, because something that is a total deal breaker to one person might not even be noticeable to somebody else. And the biggest hot button issue with the Sony a7 IV since its release is overheating. And I might take some heat for this, but I don't think that overheating is going to be an issue for most people in most situations. But if you do need a camera that can record 4K for extended periods of time, like longer than 30 minutes in a really high temperature environment, this is not the camera for you. Definitely get the a7S III or better yet, the FX3 that has a built-in fan, of which I'm a fan. Sony themselves does recommend opening the display if you're concerned about overheating because this will let more heat escape from the camera. The reason that the camera has the potential to overheat is because of that 33 megapixel sensor. That's 
a lot of data and a lot of info to process many times per second when you're recording video, and that generates a lot of heat, which is why the camera has the potential to overheat. It's also why the 12 megapixel sensor of the other cameras doesn't cause overheating because there is less data to process and there's also less like downscaling and resizing and all of that crazy complicated stuff that the camera needs to do. That's also the reason why 4K60 is cropped on this camera. It goes into Super 35 crop mode if you go to 4K at 60 FPS, and that's to use less of the sensor to generate less heat. And that's also why the camera does not have 4K 120 at all. But even though overheating has not been an issue for me in the five months that I've been using this camera so far, for the sake of this video, I did want to do some, again, super scientific testing, and I was actually very shocked by the results of these tests. Because not only did the camera overheat, but it overheated way more quickly than I would have expected. But to be fair, just like the time that I forgot I was taking the SAT until the morning of the test, this camera was set up to fail. I put it in exactly the situation that Sony says not to on a really hot day outdoors beyond the operating temperatures of the camera with the screen closed. So it was the worst possible temperature situation for the camera. These tests are the only time that overheating has ever happened for me with this camera. In my normal use and my normal workflow, it has not been an issue at all. But I do live in the desert and this is a good chance to take advantage of being in what can sometimes be literally one of the hottest places on planet Earth. On this specific day, it was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and the only places with higher temperatures in the world were in Northern Africa. Each test was done after the camera had cooled to room temperature indoors, and I fully charged the battery and freshly formatted the SD card. For the first test at 4K24, the camera ran for 19 minutes and 39 seconds before overheating. It had 83% of the battery left, and the external temperature of the camera reached 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 49 degrees Celsius. So after that, I let the camera cool down inside in the air conditioning. I reformatted the SD card and recharged the battery and then took it out for a second test. This time the camera was set to 4K60 and overheated after 15 minutes and 34 seconds with 92% of the battery remaining. It had gotten a little bit hotter outside by the time I did this test, so either because of that or because the camera was doing 60 FPS, the body of the camera reached 134 degrees Fahrenheit and 57 degrees Celsius. So if you're still rolling along with the a7 IV after the overheating test, the next big issue is rolling shutter. And again, this is something that there's really no way around when you have a high resolution sensor for video. Rolling shutter just means that if you move the camera quickly, you're going to notice that straight lines start to get bent and wobbly looking. So don't shudder at the thought of rolling shutter if you mainly use the camera locked off on a tripod or you use pretty smooth, slow camera moves. Honestly, it's also been fine for me even in vlogging situations. I haven't had really any issues with rolling shutter. Where it will become an issue is if you use the camera for a lot of quick whip pans, like you're doing sports or action or wildlife and things are moving very, very quickly, that's where you're going to start seeing rolling shutter. And if you do that kind of work a lot, you're probably going to be better off with something like the FX3 or the A7S III. And speaking of those other cameras, even though the a7 IV is significantly less expensive, it does have a few very distinct advantages over those higher end models. First and foremost, it's better for photos. Like obviously, that's why I bought this camera is because I wanted this to be my main photo camera. You can take great photos with the 12 megapixel sensor on the other cameras, but if I'm going like out or on a trip and I really wanna capture the best photos that I can and I think that I might blow them up later or I might do some kind of post-processing cropping in, something like that, having the 33 megapixels is super worth it. Animal eye autofocus is improved on this camera versus the other ones and works exceptionally well. That's great because I love to take photos and videos of our dogs. It does also have something really cool which is focus breathing compensation like the lens I'm using right now, the Sony 24 millimeter f1.4. You might notice as I move and the camera focuses in different areas, you kind of see the edge sort of pulsing a little bit. That's focus breathing. What the a7 IV does is you can turn on focus breathing compensation. It doesn't work with every lens, but it works with pretty much all Sony lenses. And then it will crop in just a little bit and eliminate that focus breathing. So you can have a lens like this that normally focus breathes, but when you're using focus breathing compensation, you won't notice any of that focus breathing. The a7 IV also has this really cool focus mapping option, where if you wanna use manual focus, it's a really cool, really handy way to check manual focus. And it's something that I'm 
really surprised is not on the higher end cameras, especially the FX3, which is technically part of Sony's cinema lineup. This really seems like a cinema level feature. As I mentioned earlier in the video, this does have super 35 mode. Even though I love a big full frame sensor, the ability to crop in can be super handy sometimes. And if you're somebody who uses mainly prime lenses like I do, it does add a bit more versatility to your lens lineup. Now, all three of these cameras can be used as USB webcams, which is awesome. But something that's really great about the a7 IV is as soon as you connect a USB cable to it, a menu will pop up on screen and ask you what you wanna do. So right there, you can just select streaming without having to dig into the menus and change settings and remember to change them back and remember where the setting is. It's really, really handy and works really great if you wanna use this camera for video calls or any kind of live streaming. The a7 IV also has a feature that I love, which is the shutter being used as a sensor cover. Of course, you do then run the risk of damaging the shutter, so you need to be very careful not to touch the shutter, but you can turn this on or off. So if you don't want that, you can just turn that feature off, but if you're like me and you really do like that, Turning it on is a huge lifesaver because I don't feel terrified to have a lens off of the camera for a few seconds. That's a pretty long list of advantages that the a7 IV has over the higher end models. A lot of those things I think could very easily be brought to the other cameras through firmware. I really hope that they are because I think that when you're spending more than $1,000 more on another camera, you should be at least getting all of the features that the cheaper camera has. So can't say for sure if that'll happen or not. Hasn't happened at the time I'm recording this video, but I hope that it does in the future. But just like every rose has its thorn, there are disadvantages to the a7 IV when compared to the higher end models. First and foremost is the lack of 4K 120. This is something that I was not interested when I got the a7S III. I didn't care about 4K 120 at all, but once I had it, I started using it all the time, and now it's a pretty integral part of my personal workflow. So if this were my only camera, the lack of 4K 120 would be a deal breaker, but since I have it on my other two cameras, I'm okay with it not being on here. So if you never use it, it's not an issue for you. If it's something that you use a lot, it's very important. The cropped 4K 60 is a potential deal breaker. Fortunately, I don't personally do a lot of 60 FPS filming, but if you do do that, then the crop could potentially be a problem because there's no way around it. I mentioned just a minute ago that the Super 35 crop was an advantage and now I'm saying it's a disadvantage, but that's because you can't choose it. You can't turn it off. I like the ability to decide now I want to crop in and now I don't. With 4K60, you're just always going to be cropped in. And as my very exhaustive scientific testing showed, overheating is also a potential disadvantage to this camera. Hasn't been an issue for me in my workflow, but it is something that's possible. I've had no overheating issues ever with my Sony a7S III. And if you really want a camera that you know will never, ever, ever overheat, that's the FX3, because again, it has a built-in fan to prevent overheating. And the very minor point that I mentioned earlier is the build quality is not quite as good as the a7S III. It's almost exactly the same, but where I really notice the difference is, is kind of in this corner over here. When I open up the card slot or the battery compartment, maybe you can kind of hear. It almost has like a hollow feeling, whereas the a7S III is very solid all throughout. So there's something about like this corner of the camera is like a little more plasticky and more hollow than the other camera. It's weird. And one other disadvantage that I didn't know about until I had the camera was using it is it does not have a little IR sensor for the Sony remote control. This is a super cheap, like 15 to $20 remote control that lets you start, stop recording, zoom in and out, access the menus. This will work with Sony's Bluetooth remotes, but those are more expensive and you have to connect Bluetooth. This one is just so much easier and I didn't know that Sony had gotten rid of that on the a7 IV. And ultimately, if you are somebody who considers yourself a hybrid shooter, or at least you do 50-50 photo video, then the a7 IV I think is a no-brainer. Like definitely this is the camera that's the way to go. And if you don't need 4K 120 or full frame 4K 60, and you're not concerned about overheating or rolling shutter, which it sounds like a lot of things, but those could potentially be non-issues for some people, then this is an incredibly solid choice. And I think you'll have an awesome time with this awesome camera. And speaking of things that are awesome, thank you to everyone who helps support my channel through Patreon and YouTube channel memberships. And be sure to check out these reviews for the Sony a7S III and FX3 to round out my Sony camera review trilogy.